There's a word intersectional that describes like how different facets of identity or different facets of thinking come together to to be someone's you know whole approach to the world or someone's whole identity, right? It's not just that I am a queer person. I am also a trans person. It's not just that I am a, a non-binary person. I'm also disabled. I might be, you know, a person of color. I might be um, someone who identifies as a first generation immigrant. You know, there's lots of different ways of thinking about all those beautiful um, like fabrics in our society that make people who they are. But inclusive marketing is all about, you know, not just focusing in on like one group in particular, but thinking about like, how do we improve the whole, right? Hi, welcome back to SaaS Half Full, the only show serving B2B SaaS marketers. I'm Lindsay Groper, president at Blast Media. And as always, I will be both your host and bartender today. I had the opportunity to sit down with Sarah Reynolds, who is the CMO at HiBob, and they share their opinions on what you need to have truly inclusive marketing. It's a topic that is way overdue at SaaS Half Full and something that we've been wanting to unpack for quite some time. So grab a drink and join me as I speak with Sarah from HiBob. So excited to have you on the show. And I was talking to you before I hit record that you got one of my favorite drink selections that we sent you. What did you choose for our conversation today? Um, I chose this massive party can, of what is billed as a passion fruit cosmopolitan. So uh, I did bring a glass instead of just a straw for the entire can because it is a Monday when we're recording. But um, it's a it's a beautiful purple color for those of you who are consuming this as both an audio and visual medium. Love it. And there is not a lot of scale on the platform that we use to to choose and curate the cocktails. I had no idea that that can serves 12 people. And the first guest that held it up, I about died. It was awesome. Uh, it is a very dreary, cold ass Monday here in Indianapolis. We're hovering at 42 degrees. And I, I didn't know it felt like a red wine kind of afternoon. So uh, I'm doing red wine with the glass that says, because raising tiny humans ain't easy. And no, it ain't. <laughs> uh, well, well, shortly, but it, it just, I don't know, it felt like a wintry red wine kind of day, unfortunately. Uh, well, super excited to have you, Sarah. I know you and I have never met. Uh, you are four-ish months into your role at as CMO at Hi Bob. Is that right? Uh, about two and a half, actually. So even earlier really on my old. journey. Oh, my goodness. Very, very early in your journey. Um, so appreciate you coming in to chat with us. As you know, our listeners primarily consist of SaaS marketing leaders. We do have some founders and maybe some that maybe oversee revenue and not too specific to marketing. But when we approached you, because we said, hey, Sarah seems like uh, they'd be a fantastic guest, is you could have talked about anything. And you came back and said, what I'd really, really like to talk to is inclusive marketing. And it is embarrassingly a topic that we have not talked about on this show. Uh, my colleague and I were both like, shit, we haven't yet addressed this topic. Like, what the, what the hell? So I'm so glad that you're on. But why did you choose this topic? Why is this something that you're passionate about? So um, just maybe by means of introduction, thank you for practicing my pronouns. My name is Sarah. My pronouns are they and them. I'm a very proudly, openly queer, uh, non-binary and disabled person who occupies a seat in the C-suite and occupies a chief marketing officer job. Inclusive marketing is important to me because of my identity. But as a marketer, it's important to me because it helps you widen your audience. So for all of us who are asked to do more with less, I am here to tell you why inclusive marketing is like your secret for success and your secret for audience widening. Inclusive marketing has been in the news a lot recently. So, um, you know, Bud Light has been in the news for uh, inclusive marketing. There's been some conversation about, you know, what is it like to work with a non-binary or trans influencer? What is your responsibility as a brand when you do that? And how should you think about, you know, using that power or that bravery of inclusive marketing for good? Uh, and think about the responsibility that goes along with that. So I am really, I love this topic. I'm so excited to talk to you about it today. And I am really looking forward to diving. Same, me too. Before we do, I want to give our listeners a bit more history into your journey into SaaS marketing. Sure. So we talk about that and then specifically what HiBub, HiBub does, why does it exist? Yeah. I was the kid who didn't know what they wanted to be when they grew up. I did a fancy degree in undergraduate in history and dead languages, which coming from one of those STEM families, my folks were like, wow, this kid is never getting off our couch. 
And then I was like, you know what? Throw that fancy degree away. I think I want to go to culinary school. I love to cook. It's what I do in my spare time when I'm not here or out in the garden tending to the vegetables I'm trying to grow so that I can cook them. I figured out pretty quickly that culinary school wasn't for me. It wasn't the job path that I wanted. And I ended up working in the Boston tech scene through some uh, network connections. I started working at this really small ed tech startup, like 10 people. And uh, one day, the one person in marketing uh, left the company. And I was in business development. I was in like a, a proto sort of like BDR role. And I was absolutely dog shit at it. But the CEO walked over to my desk and said, you know what? You're not good at calling people on the phone, but you are like you are smart. And I'm sure that you can figure this out. And so that was my auspicious start in marketing. Uh, I moved from ed tech into HR tech, which is like the industry that I grew up in, especially like SaaS in the HR industry, which I really, really have loved to sort of like watch the momentum grow around. And then I did a pivot into industrial software because I, I had the opportunity to try something new and, and similarly to, to jump on an organization that was moving from perpetual to subscription and then into the SaaS, um, you know, sort of like thought experiment and, and go to market motion and delivery motion. And I'm back in HR tech. Um, you asked, you know, what is what is HiBob? HiBob is a modern HR platform for the people who really care about their organization's biggest asset, which is their people. For us, we spend a lot of time talking to great HR thought leaders who want their people to be more productive. They want them to be more efficient. They want them to uh, use tools that bring them joy in the workplace as opposed to just, you know, make them like really frustrating. And for us, we're delivering that joy through this modern, beautiful HRIS, you know, HR data platform that allows employees to do everything from, you know, view an org chart and request time off and, and manage their employee record to share how they feel about their company, um, you know, share how they self-identify, share their identity in the workplace um, and start a conversation with their employer about what does it mean? What is my feedback about working here? Either, either like with their name attached or confidentially. So it's a tremendously powerful platform. I'm really excited to be back in the HR space that I love so much. And I'm really excited to be doing something that lets me talk about the things that I love. And we are users of Bob at Blast Media when uh, we hired our VP of People two years ago and she was adamant that we change our HRIS system and switch over to Bob and it's been transformative. We love the reporting, love the ability to also survey anonymously, create connections. It's been awesome. I have to go back to what you said your original major was, which was history. Did you say in dead languages? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a history and classical oh, studies awesome. what double major. Gonna do? Like, what does one do with that? Do you then teach history in dead languages? If you, like what, do you yeah, if you if you major in classical studies, and sometimes you want to go into teaching. Uh, you know, you want to teach Latin in high school, or you want to you want to move into like a professorship or a tenure track at a university. It's actually like a pretty common pre law major um, because really? it's like dead languages and the way that you conjugate them and stuff like that, and and you know, learning a new alphabet or learning about you know different cultures. Like it's a it's a really great way of like challenging your brain to think differently and also dead languages are really fucking hard like there's a reason that people say it's all greek to me uh it's because greek is really hard to learn as i found out um and it, i was lucky that i i ended up being kind of good at it but um yeah it's uh it made my folks like i said super nervous about what i was going to do with my life sure sure i just had to revisit that because i have <laughs> not worked at form and i literally wrote it down awesome Okay, well, let, let's dive into inclusive marketing. We're talking about inclusivity as it, as it relates to our discipline and as our function. But where should this culture of inclusivity start? Because oftentimes it's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's in marketing's got it. But talk to me about where that should start, where that should live, how you uncover what your, if you don't know, maybe what your organization's culture is. Uh, when it comes to inclusivity. Yeah. So if you're on the marketing side of the house, I think this is a great opportunity for you to make friends on the HR side of the house. I tell my friends on the HR side of the house all the time that they should reach out to their friends on the marketing side. But I think this is a this is a joint opportunity for conversation because I think that the main thing you need to think about when you embark on a journey to become more inclusive, whether you're thinking about company culture or you're thinking about the the marketing and the face that you put out to the world is how do you make it authentic? to your actual experience. So your friends in HR are going to know the answer to questions like, 
do we know how many employees identify as members of different marginalized groups? Do we know what their employee experience is like as an organization? Do we have some of the foundational building blocks in place like ERG, employee resource group, who can maybe counsel us on you know, what, what it's like to work here as someone who identifies as one of these groups? You want to make sure that you're understanding sort of the baseline for your organization because I think that it's really important that you start to build not just a marketing engine, but a conversation that's going to feel authentic to the people who actually work in your company day in and day out. There's like a big conversation, you know, Pride Month is coming up in June, right? And people change their logos to be the rainbow flag colors. And there are people who call it pride washing or for rainbow washing during Pride Month when these organizations who I don't know uh, donate a lot of money to conservative politicians, but then come out and put a rainbow on everything and pretend that it's like, OK, and that they're inclusive to the LGBTQIA plus uh, you know, market to try and to try and garner some consumer support. Um, that doesn't really feel authentic. That doesn't make anybody feel like you really are that supportive, inclusive brand that you're trying to put out into the world. And it doesn't ultimately help you widen your audience. What does help you is making it authentic and being real about, you know, how you support these communities, not just during Pride Month or Black History Month or like Women's History Month, but but all year round. And when I think of inclusive marketing, I mean, many and many people probably do too. It's like, yeah, we're inclusive. We have, we show diversity in our images and our photos. We're making sure there's the all different colored hands. That inclusivity goes way, way, way beyond that. And so I want you, uh, if you could talk us through what are the different elements, both visually and from a copy perspective, that oftentimes get overlooked that are going to become more and more in the spotlight if we don't all catch up. Yeah, that's a great question. There's a word intersectional that describes like how different facets of identity or different facets of thinking come together to to be someone's you know whole approach to the world or someone's whole identity. Right. It's not just that I am a queer person. I am also a trans person. It's not just that I am a, a non-binary person. I'm also disabled. I might be you know a person of color. I might be um, someone who identifies as a first generation immigrant. You know, there's lots of different ways of thinking about all those beautiful um, like fabrics in our society that make people who they are. But inclusive marketing is all about, you know, not just focusing in on like one group in particular, but thinking about like, how do we improve the whole, right? Lots of people think about um, the singular they, right? That, that singular there is my pronoun. So it's something I ask my teams about when I join a new organization. Do we use the singular they or do we do that awkward thing where we say he slash she, uh, which is reading very, very outdated at the moment. You know, when we talk about groups of people, do we say, hey, guys. Or do we pick a word in the beautiful English language that simply doesn't have a gendered component attached and say, hey, people or hey, folks or hey, friends or hey, team or hey, all or y'all or, you know, yins. If you're from Pittsburgh, I'm not. So I can't get away with it. But there's lots of different ways that like gender, for example, creeps into our language. There's lots of different ways that ability should be considered in our marketing. So you might be um, thinking about the image that you're putting on the website and making sure that you have, you know, folks of many different races or many different body types or many different abilities represented in the image. But are you alt texting the image to make sure that someone who's engaging with your website through a screen reader is actually understanding what the image is portraying to the viewer? Or are you just leaving them high and dry? Are you writing your uh, text in all caps? which is something that is very difficult for folks with learning disabilities and just generally folks in the population to read as compared to, yeah, as compared to sentence case. Like this is something that we're working on right now. I can I can be totally candid with you because all all ta all caps rather is, is part of some of our brand work. And it is, you know, something that on the web or in print is much harder to parse, regardless of the, the ability that you come to the table with, than something that's written in sentence case, which is designed for easy reading. There's obviously a discussion to be had about the people who are featured in your images. You know, I worked with a brand who catered to makeup artists and, you know, they they got very quick client feedback that you know, if you're portraying a makeup artist, you need to be portraying not just uh, a beautiful Instagram model white woman, but also, you know, people of many different genders, people of many different ages, of many different races, uh, not just, you know, from the the person sitting in the client chair, but also from the practitioner side, because the makeup industry is 
just as diverse as any other beautiful industry on this beautiful planet of ours. There's lots of different ways. You know, you can work on like removing ableist language from your vocabulary. So not describing things as crazy or mental, uh, thinking about how those words are are triggers. There's there's lots of different conversations about you know, what people call like dog whistles for race when you're making like comments that that are racist or some people might say racially coded, although I think that that's gentle and letting people get away with it. There's lots of different ways that whether you're you're trying to stop saying redheaded stepchild because, you know, you have a friend who is a ginger like me or has stepchildren and doesn't understand why that is considered like something that is uh, offensive, like that, like, why does it matter what they look like or their relationship to me or whether you're trying to convince people to stop saying queer as a slur and stop saying queer is something that means odd, but rather is a beautiful name that we're reclaiming as part of our community language. There's lots of different opportunities, I think, for you to be more thoughtful and just be more mindful about the language and the imagery that you're choosing to use and the way that you're coding your websites uh, that we that we choose to use as marketers every day. Yeah, and to your point, it is a work in progress, and, and we've been uncovering this over time in our agency as well. And we have a DEIB lead now um, and a DEIB committee, and we, you know, the for us, it's like, okay, we need to have the intentionality first yep. where we are all aware that this is a work in progress and that we we do have to really checks and balances in place. But to your point, I mean, there's stuff that we're constantly learning. I actually had to look up, you would use the, in our exchange prior, the, the term non-ableist language. Mm-hmm. And I had to look it up and then I went, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but even things for, for us is, is words that, to your point, traditionally we've just used that have a, a connotation that is you know, really triggering to some folks and, and things like uh, the word master. You had said, you know, being authentic, not being you know, token-esque. And that's something I noticed even, gosh, gosh it was three years ago now, but um, when the Black Lives Matter movement came in, uh, and there was the black screens uh, in support of, and I noticed that there were a lot of brands who were participating in that. But then I kind of went back and I'm like, historically, like y'all haven't even weighed in on this before or you actually not even addressed any really societal or racial issues in the past. You haven't you know, celebrated or honored certain things. So that was a, a flag for me where I really saw sort of that token um, or I had that token feeling like you're participating. It's not really authentic to your brand. So. Talk to us about advice you would have for kind of, maybe you're a marketer entering a new organization and and you notice that I was going to say that's not being inclusive, but you notice that you don't really as an organization weigh in on programs, on societal issues. And then all of a sudden there's a call to let's participate in this. Uh, do you is your advice like stair step into it to slowly start participating to under, you know figure out your point of view first or you ju- do you just say dive in? and then continue to go full force on it? I would definitely say to be intentional about it. You mentioned how this is a journey, you know, the language that we use, for example, moving away from outdated terms into more modern terms that that carry the same, uh, that mean the same thing in the end, but don't accidentally offend anyone in the way that we say. I think that, you know, commenting on social issues or, you know, making your brand more inclusive and participating in some of those opportunities is is a beautiful thing. Like, I genuinely think that inclusive marketing is smart marketing. But I do think you need to be intentional about it because I can tell you as someone who is a practitioner of this, we get asked all the time, you know, OK, you're going to you're going to comment on something in the media or you're going to talk about inclusive marketing. Well, how are you being inclusive? How are you being inclusive in your marketing? How are you being inclusive as Hiba? How are how is your product helping to promote inclusivity for your customers? You also, as a marketer or as a communications professional, you know that you are not the only person who gets asked that question. So you need to make sure that if you're going to be talking about some of these topics, that you're doing education for all of the spokespeople in your organization. And you also need to have a pretty clear pulse on how those people feel about those issues, because pro tip, like not every executive is going to stand up and say exactly the line that you have written for them when they are asked a question about how they, I don't know, support employees from marginalized backgrounds. 
So I think that it's a learning opportunity for organizations. Like if you feel really strongly that you want to participate in one of these conversations, then God damn it, like you better be doing the education internally to be able to make sure that anybody who picks up the phone can can give the right comment or can give a perspective that you would be proud of. But you also, you know, you need to be intentional and you need to know like where what are the things that if we comment on this for the very first time, like what are the things that suddenly become an expectation that we'll be commenting on going forward and how will we respond to those? Because it's not enough to to say, OK, we yeah, we feel super confident, you know, commenting on LGBTQIA plus issues and we're going to start by celebrating the beautiful Pride Month in June. What do you do with the next opportunity? What do you do when it, you know, stop Asian hate? What do you do when it's Black Lives Matter? What do you do when it's a specific part of the LGBTQIA plus community, the trans community who is under fire? What do you do when it's police brutality? What do you do when it is all of these things? And it can feel overwhelming, but I think that having a strong point of view as a marketer and a strand, strong point of view of how your brand is going to respond and react intentionally to these types of topics or not, by the way, like you don't have to. Right. You can take a back seat and, and sit back and listen and learn until you are ready to participate in that dialogue. I think that that is what is really going to help you maybe like set the right tone, even if this is your first foray into into the commentary. And with your previous role and then currently with Hi Bob, do you have a more like a system checks and balances, uh, any sort of framework that you've built to help catch bias, to help train on bias language? And, you know, where's that intersection between training people and using technology? Yeah, there's definitely opportunities to to do both, right? If you're interested in learning, for example, about inclusive language that impacts the tech community, uh, Buffer, which is a, a social media like queuing scheduling platform, they put together what they call the Incomplete Guide to Inclusive Language for Startups in Tech. And it's just like a blog post, right? But it's lots of different intersectional ways of thinking about inclusive language that maybe you've never bumped into before. I share that resource a lot with folks when I start talking to them about inclusive language because there's many different ways of thinking about it. I think if you're trying to do, you know, training around whether it's unconscious bias or writing a more inclusive job description, you want to rely on someone who's an expert in that field. So if you're, for example, interested in how to get more applicants to your job descriptions, might I recommend Kat Kibben, who uh, is an expert in their field on just this topic. They're a wonderful person in the HR market who comments about inclusivity all the time, but specifically with the lens of HR on it. If you're thinking about how wonderful the opportunity for chat GPT is, and oh, by the way, should we maybe be concerned about the bias that it is? like introducing into the language and writing pieces that we deploy it against, then there's lots of different folks, including, you know, folks at like companies like Textio, who think about how do we reduce bias from performance reviews or job descriptions or marketing copy, right? If you're thinking about using technology to catch some of these things, there, there are lots of different solutions. I mean, Textio is one that I, I happen to know of and be a big admirer of. But there's also like marketing copy solutions and there's there's folks who specialize in or organizations who specialize in doing you know more inclusive review of your copy. There's also organizations who specialize in. Um, making sure that your websites are, you know, inclusive to people who are consuming them through something like a screen reader. There's lots of different like frameworks and checks and balances or even software solutions that are going to allow you to figure out, you know, I need to crawl my website and, and figure out if I have alt text. I need to make sure that my pages are structured with with header tags and, you know, body copy tags to make sure that they're readable, blah, blah, blah. A lot of these get deployed in our industry with a focus on SEO. Like right. people are familiar with them because they use them to solve an organization or paid layout challenge for SEO, but they can also be used to promote inclusivity. There's a fantastic Twitter account that is all about accessibility on the web, not just on websites, but also in electronic documents, PDFs, imagery, uh, the use of emojis, like how to tweet more accessibly which uh, is is a fantastic resource and one that I call upon all the time to to look at. How could I think differently about this? I hadn't considered what happens, for example, if you put five emojis at the end of your message. Uh, if that gets read out to you, it 
becomes very difficult to parse what you mean. You know, I think there's a tremendous opportunity here, but there's also like small little things you can do that doesn't require you to invest in a big consulting project or or bring in a big, you know, training exercise or engage with a management consulting firm on a DEI audit. You can do something as simple as remove the requirement for a bachelor's or master's degree from your job descriptions and instantly make them potentially more inclusive to your candidate pool. You can do things like choose to use the singular they in your marketing copy. You can do things like, you know, not say hi, guys, when you enter a meeting. I mean, there's there's like things that are very much within our control as hiring managers or as uh, marketers or just as employees in the companies in which we work uh, that allow us to make like everything that we do a little bit more inclusive. Absolutely. And I will, I wrote down a couple of these resources and we'll make sure to include those links when we, we get this episode up. Uh, you guys is definitely one in my vocabulary that's been there forever that I am very conscious about using. I use way too much. And this was brought to my attention a year ago uh, by a colleague and we uh, actually rolled it out and talked to our whole agency about it because I don't know if it's a Midwest thing also, mm-hmm. but it is something, it's a term that we use all the time. And so we're replacing with the y'all's friends, us, we, however we can do it to get rid of the you guys. I want to put this contextually into something that's happening now-ish. I'm, I'm sure you have all heard about the Bud Light. I don't even know what to call it. It wasn't an incident and it wasn't a scandal. <laughs> It was long in time, and I I have so many thoughts on it, but I want to get your thoughts on it, Sarah. Recap for us your take on what went down and what we can all learn from it. Yeah, um, I think, so maybe to recap for folks who haven't seen the news, Bud Light uh, partnered with a trans influencer who was celebrating her 365 days of being a woman. And they sent her care package, basically, you know, a a branded like influencer gift set, you know, custom branded Bud Light cans with her face on it saying congratulations. And it was a beautiful moment. And prior to launching this partnership, their head of marketing was interviewed on a podcast saying how she had been given the remit to move Bud Light beyond a fratty, bro-y, you know, kind of challenging, shall we say, brand reputation and modernize it and make it more inclusive and and reach more consumers to my point about audience widening. And so, you know, one of the things that she chose, she and her team chose to do was to do this partnership. Um, what happened uh, was that, uh, uh, you know, folks who maybe don't think that people like me should exist in a public space or folks who um, don't understand why we are so vocal as a community about, you know, the issues that that are play in our everyday lives or who don't understand something maybe that they're unfamiliar with. Uh, They reacted super negatively to it. Uh, Kid Rock uh, put up some social media posts like shooting at cans of Bud Light in his yard really poorly, by the way. Uh, And, you know, like a bunch of people were buying Bud Light, buying Bud Light marketers hearing cha-ching, buying Bud Light to port down the drain or saying that they were never going to drink Bud Light again and, and you know, being pictured with like Miller Coors, uh, long, longtime sponsor of Pride Miller Coors uh, uh, products. Mm-hmm. It was um, it was really interesting. I talked to someone who, well, we were talking about how different communities protest in different ways uh, and this like very visible, like very loud social media protest convinced Bud Light, um, some executive of Bud Light to put out a a uh, statement, you know, sort of walking it back and essentially putting the the marketer in charge on leave. And, you know, it, like basically they they attempted to garner all of the good press. They tried to do the inclusive advertising thing without a culture of inclusivity, without the accountability and the responsibility of supporting the influencers who they are then putting into a very public spotlight. The woman who who is at the you know, quote unquote, center of this discussion is a public figure, right? But she's also a public figure who exists as being openly trans on the internet, which means that like me, uh, she gets death threats when she is herself on the internet. That is really challenging. That's a new landscape for brands. And Bud Light did probably the worst thing that you can do, which is to back away, to not be supportive and to back away from it 
after, you know, suddenly social media blew up. Uh, I think that that is an incredible, incredibly sad uh, an incredibly dangerous thing for brands to do, to to try and capitalize on including us in their marketing uh, and making us a target and then immediately removing all support and like m- making a spectacle of our identity and our existence in the world rather than being supportive and using us for, for, for good uh, and, and to start a really interesting conversation and to start a conversation about the future of a brand. Yeah, it. The aftermath was was really mishandled. I, I um, think the statement that was made was something around the lines of moving forward, we're going to ensure that all levels of the executive team approve stuff before it happens. It's like, come on. Yep. Really? You, so you're saying that, oh, had we have known, we would have never let this happen. That's such bullshit. And to put her on a mandatory leave of absence, also to your point, it. She was charged with, she was asked to do a thing. She did a thing. And then now it's being punished for it. Yep. So, it, yeah, it, it makes no sense. But their sales did drop. I mean, I think that's all they dropped by like 17%. Um, and their stock their, price you know, went up though. You know, I, you know, I think what's interesting is, is sales went down. And if you understand how the liquor industry and the distribution network and all that stuff work, people who go to the store and, and buy it just to pour it down the drain, like, Actually, that that is kind of a supply and demand thing there, folks, just FYI. It's interesting because their stock price did go up during during the height of this. And AB InBev is a really big company, right? It's not just Bud Light that's in their product portfolio. Yeah. There's there's a lot of different things at play there. But I think that it's been it's been tremendously disappointing to see a brand who had the opportunity to be responsible and the opportunity to be accountable choose to simply walk away uh, and to not just simply walk away, but so, so demonstrably like walk away and so um, disappointingly walk away and irresponsibly walk away from a situation that was wholly of their creation. Uh, you, you have the opportunity to like engage with marginalized communities up front and make these people part of your teams. I guarantee you that there are LGBTQIA plus people who work at AB InBev, probably who work in their marketing team, who can tell you what you should expect if you're partnering with an influencer from this community, how you can be supportive, what you need to do, what kind of backlash you're probably going to get and give you plans A, B, C, D, E, and S for like dealing with it when this, when something happens and, you know, how to, how to ride it out until the community or to, to the conversation moves on to something different rather than continuing to feed the fire and feeding the trolls. Uh, Instead, you decided that Either you didn't want to engage those people at the front end to build those plans or you didn't want to listen to them because you decided to do basically the worst thing that you possibly could. Absolutely. I I agree. It was a complete debacle, but something from which we can all learn. Well, this has been awesome. This topic has been way overdue and and I almost think we need a part two and a part three because we're just scratching the surface on it. But Sarah, as I ask every guest to end our show, I ask if you have a signature or favorite toast to send us out. I have been thinking about this since you posed this question to me. And uh, most of my toasts are uh, probably not appropriate for, for any marketing podcast. Yeah. You, you surprised <laughs> our bar for this show. Very, very low. So, so perhaps I will say a favorite line of mine that so many people have like sent back to me as an Instagram meme over the last couple of weeks, which is some people have girlfriends, some people have boyfriends. I have three beverages with me at all times. Cheers. Cheers. I mean, now you have an entire party can of beverage. Yeah, exactly. Feeds we, 12. <laughs> Thanks again to Sarah for joining me on SAS Half Full. Love that topic. Could have talked to them for hours on this. It is something that we've been wanting to tackle for quite some time. And hopefully you had a couple of things that you took away from the conversation to truly make your marketing more inclusive to broaden your audience and appeal. If you've listened to the very end of this episode, thank you so much. We appreciate it. This is our one more drink segment where I ask all of our guests the same question to end the episode. And that is, what do you wish more CEOs understood about marketing? And here's Sarah's answer. I wish that more CEOs understood that it was as much an art 
as it was a science. I can't tell you how many people want marketing to be rocket science, brain surgery, coin operated, it, you know, spend a dollar, get a dollar fifty back. And gosh, I really wish that I worked in a field that was as predictable as that. Like, that's amazing. But the reality is that at least 50%, if not more, of marketing is vibes. Like, we're just vibing it out. Like, we, we are using all of those fancy degrees that we got that taught us to think or all of the life experience that we had that taught us about what are what's going to happen when we do a specific action or when we bring a specific topic into the public field. Like, the value of your diverse team is that they come with vibes that are influenced by all of their beautiful professional and lived experiences. And that means that you're going to get the right answer when you have to tackle marketing challenges that are the vibe side of marketing versus just the data side. I love making a data driven decision as much as anyone. I'm sure that all of your guests do. But there are so many times where you need to either make data driven decisions in the concert, like in the in concert with vibes, or you just need to make a gut choice and go with it and commit and see what happens and learn from that experience. Uh, Hi, Bob has a value like grow through what we go through. And I think that that's a beautiful way of thinking about marketing because so much of it is going to be, you know, dependent on you building a diverse team who can bring those beautiful experiences to the table and can counsel you when you need to do something that is vibe based. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, bottoms up. <laughs>